Great to see you again Thursday evening. We're talking about the church, right? We've, we've talked about the space. We've talked about windows. We've talked about the organ. We've talked about the rail doors. We've talked about the wood floor that we stand on and all the wonderful carvings all over this parish. But you may not know what's up this staircase, right? As you're sitting out there in the pew and you're looking up at the cross over to your right, there's stairs that disappear up into some hidden room. We're gonna go up there and see what's up there today and why it's there and the purpose that space serves. But what you'll see just over my shoulder is an icon. And here at Epiphany Parish, we've developed a, a tradition of hanging icons on the stairwell up to the vesting room. Some icons people have acquired, some are things they've given to the church, some are icons that parishioners have written. You write an icon, you don't paint it. Right? Because it is a story written to tell us something about saints who have gone ahead of us in the kingdom of heaven. Anyway, we're going to go upstairs and we're going to take a look at the vesting room. I can't wait to show you uh, a little bit uh, about what it looks like and who lives up there. Somebody who lives up there. We'll go meet them. So here we are up in the vesting room at Epiphany Parish. You came up the steps past the icon into this space where we keep all of the sacred vestments. And it's where we come and we prepare for a worship service and we pray. And it's a, it's a place with a, a lot of tradition and, and mystery. And, and some even say there is a portal here through which vergers can go back and forth through time. Uh, but only the great vergers within our tradition have access to this particular portal, like Diane Carlisle, our head verger. Hi, Diane. Well, hello. Great boy. to see you, Diane. Uh, it has, has led the liturgy at Epiphany Parish for, well, I, I don't want to say for generations upon generations, but certainly for 12 to 10 years, probably. Uh, she's a Christianer here, of course, but also on staff in uh, my right hand partner in putting together everything liturgical in our uh, worship life. Great to see you. Great to see you as well, Dwight. What the heck is a verger? Well, a verger is exactly what you just said, an assistant to the rector in liturgy. And vergers go back a long way. They go back to the medieval ages uh, in the Church of England, and they were the caretakers of the church. They made sure that everything that was supposed to happen happened and everything that wasn't supposed to happen didn't happen. <laughs> Very good, and, and that's still the case. Dan and I work so close together that we're, we really live in the same COVID bubble. Why did the verger carry a stick, Diane? Well, it's not really called a stick, it's called a verge. Okay, okay. And what happened is the rector of the church would live across the marketplace and the procession would start at the rector's house. And so the verger would use the verge to get the animals out of the marketplace in order to get to the church. Aha, uh -huh. very practical. So Diane, what happens up here on any given Sunday? What, what, what are these, uh, uh, what would we call these, shades to the verger portal <laughs> that are hanging in front of this closet? Well, the, uh, over here is a gown, and this is very traditional in the Church of England. And what's really interesting about this is it has these kind of double sleeves with the chevron. And back in the medieval ages, these were actual pockets and they carried the Bibles and the prayer books for the priests because lay people weren't allowed to touch them. Oh. Um, and so this is worn on high holy days. And this is uh, called a shamir, very similar to what a bishop wears. Um, and it's worn during normal things to be thrown over a cassock. And the cassock is the working dress of, of the church. And what are you wearing here? Well, this is a cassock, um, and it's what I wear when I'm not serving at the altar. Diane, what do we have here? Uh, you showed us uh, the shamir and uh, the cassock. Uh, what are these uh, vestments? Well, so over here, we have what's called a cassock alb. Uh, in the old days, this would be worn over the cassock uh, for services, especially services of Holy Eucharist. It's worn by everybody that's in the service. The priests, the acolytes, the Eucharistic ministers would all, all wear this. Now, 
This is called a cassock gown because now we don't wear it over a cassock. That's just way too much material. And sometimes people wear a cincture around their waist. And the cincture has a, a practical purpose in that it keeps the alb closed. But it also is, is meant to um, sacrifice the whip that whipped um, Jesus. So um, the priests don't wear theirs. They have a slightly different kind of alb. But this is the alb that is worn by the Eucharistic ministers and Adelites. And then over here, we have underneath this tippet is a surplus, and the surplus is worn um, by people doing the offices. So even song, morning prayer, evening prayer, things like that um, would wear this when there's no Eucharist, so funerals and weddings. And again, it's worn by clergy and lay people alike. And then the tippet is this right here, and it's, it's, it's called a preaching tippet, generally worn by the officiant and somebody who's preaching. Um, and then, if people have an advanced degree, they can also wear a hood, their academic hood, um, and is that signifies where they graduated from. So, Diane, the, uh, the patches on the tippet, uh, why those patches, um, and wh why patches on a tippet? What do they represent? So, in this particular case, these, this is a generic... Uh, tippet worn by our lay people, and so this is the shield for uh, the Episcopal Church. And over here is the, the uh, patch for the Diocese of Olympia. Also, um, this is the patch for the Vergers Guild of the Episcopal Church, um, which I wear. And then uh, clergy wear their, their church, where, <laughs> their college where they graduated from on um, their own personal tippets. So it's interesting. I, I've heard that in ages past, when the uh, priests who were teaching at the colleges uh, a long time ago would come in for evening prayer, they would be wearing their cassock, they would throw the white um, surplus over uh, to you know, clean them up, and then put on their hoods and their tippets, and, and everybody knew what their academic rank was. Uh, and where they went to college and what house they lived with. So it was sort of like a, uh, what a, one of those scarves that people wear at soccer games, right? It, it sort of it indicates allegiance and identity. Uh, is that right? Is that exactly. Good? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and so it's funny how the traditions carry on for hundreds of years, right? And, and now they maybe mean less than they did back, uh, you know, back in the olden days. The place you go when you go through the Verger's portal. <laughs> what else do we have in this room? Let's take a look around. Diane, we have these wonderful built-in drawers here. What's in them and uh, what's falling out of them uh, in the haphazard way I pulled them out of the drawers for the shot? So these hanging out are the stools that priests wear and also the chasubles, which you'll hear about in just a few minutes, uh, are stored in here and very lovingly taken care of by our altar guild. And this, we have stools for each liturgical color that you'll hear about in a moment. And the stools are worn by the priests. And they, you know, practically they were to help keep them warm in the old days. Um, is there another reason that priests wear stools? I think to keep them warm. It also a, a, a signifies being yoked to Christ. And it is, it is worn like a yoke um, over the priest's shoulders. So now we'll finish up uh, looking at this part of the room. We have these big boxes up here. Uh, this isn't where we store the St. John's Bibles. Those are back in the North X. Uh, but these are uh, the boxes that they came in. And if we needed to store them in a box, we have those right here. Uh, you can see we have these different um, uh, cupboards uh, where albs and... Uh, cassocks are kept and people come up here and my cupboards way down at the end and Ruth Ann's is right here and, and we share these other cupboards is where we keep all of our vestments. And finally we have these uh, chasubles, these incredibly beautiful chasubles. I'm going to have Diane talk a little bit more about them because she knows something of the history of these and also uh, the significance of color and, uh, and whatnot. Diane tell us about all of your uh, chasubles here. 
Thanks. This is the blue chasuble. It's worn during the season of Advent, which is one of our two penitential seasons. Uh, this was given to us in 1995 by Lee Noel in memory of her mother who died in 1994. And blue is associated with the color of Mary. Uh, so that's why we use blue. Some churches don't use blue. They continue with the purple. Um, but that's a choice that we can make. And then the next two chasubles, the white chasuble and the purple chasuble, were made by Sandra Darling, a parishioner here at Epiphany. Uh, she designed them with Deutz's input, and they really are original to our church. You can see here that it has the Tudor roses and the vines and the Lamb of God, which are part of our Riridos that Deutz talked about. Uh, the Tudor rose is a symbol for the Anglican church, and it symbolizes the, um, the coming together of the houses of Lancaster and York uh, in England, and then has the vines around it. And so this is worn uh, during the season of Christmas and the season of Easter. It's worn on weddings and funerals, as well as other high holy days, uh, like the baptism of Jesus, Holy Trinity, Sunday, and All Saints Day. And then next we have the purple vestment, the purple chasuble, which is worn during the season of Lent. Um, and it is our penitential season. And you'll see on here we have the grapes, the vine, Jesus is the vine. It also has wheat that signifies the Eucharist on it. And Sandra and Doit also designed this one. And then next to it, we have the red chasuble. Red chasuble is not worn very much. It's typically given to a priest when they're ordained. Um, and this one happened to have been given to Doit on his ordination. And it's worn uh, on Pentecost, on Palm Sunday, and days that celebrate uh, martyrs. Um, and it signifies the Holy Spirit, the Passion also. I, I probably should jump in and say, uh, because my mom's going to be watching this video, that my mom made this for me uh, in celebration of my ordination. Next to the red one, we have the rose-colored vestment. You will only see this vestment twice a year. You'll see it on the third Sunday of Advent and the fourth Sunday of Lent. And they are lighter colors of purple, not really a lighter color of blue, but they're, they're meant to signify the center of those two seasons. Um, they are called Gaudate Sunday and Letari Sunday. Um, and this particular vestment was given to us by Libby Goldstein. It came to us from St. Therese Church just up the street, the Catholic Church. Um, after Vatican II, they no longer used this particular chasuble and so she brought it to us and we're very thankful for that. And then finally, we have the green chasuble. The green is is worn during ordinary time. And ordinary time is the season between the uh, Feast of Epiphany and the beginning of Lent, and also uh, at the day after Pentecost through uh, the end of ordinary time, which the, before, the Sunday before Advent. And the color green symbolizes growth, and it's when we grow in our relationship with Jesus through his teachings. And we don't really know much about the history of this one. We've asked some people, and uh, if you know anything about it, we'd love to know. <laughs> so this is... these are all worn during the Eucharist, um, and they uh, are holy ponchos. But they're also meant uh, to mimic the gown, uh, the, what, the tunic that Jesus wore without seams, and also what the Romans wore in their high feasts. Well, these are beautiful. Thank you, uh, Diane. Thank you for taking care of them uh, and for telling us so much about them. Uh, finally, we, uh, I'll, I'll say one last thing while we're up here. Um, Epiphany has a carol on. We hear the bells, the neighbors hear the bells. It reminds folks to, to run to church service. But really just that we're here, we're present, and, and we hold a holy time chronologically and Kairos time, right, the big, beautiful kingdom of God time, um, but the carillon is controlled from this very room. Diane, how's the carillon work? So this is our carillon. 
no, it is not a bunch of bells rang by a bunch of people. It's actually a computerized system where it's recordings of bells. And we can record it to play tunes. Uh, it rings every hour unless we turn it off uh, so we don't bother the school or the neighbors at, at midnight. Um, and it's, it's just programmed right up here. And uh, we love to play with it and play different songs. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Paul, that you do here, managing things, caring for this place, and your good work around the energy.